tardes. Gracias por estar aquí. Thank you so much for being here today in this uh, panel. We have so many interesting co concurrent panels at the Dominican State Association, and we're grateful that you decided to come to ours. Um, at the same time, we're having another one dedicated to also Dominican studies on um, First Blacks, which is the and the first rebellion in 1520, 1521 first slave rebellion in the Americas. So it's at the same time. So I understand if any of you will go there afterwards or um, you will decide to stay here. So thank you, my name is Sara Ponte. I am the chief librarian at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute and also an associate professor at uh, the City College Libraries. I am so honored uh, to be here today with mi queridísimo profesor, mi querido mentor, el profesor Silvio Torres Ayán que me vio como quien dice nacer <laughs> en el mundo de Dominican Studies, no que viejo, you know, he was the one that uh, guided me through the process since day, day one when I began as a college work study student at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute. So thank you so much, Profesor, for creer en mí y por el apoyo que siempre me ha brindado. <laughs> I know that you're going to be going to different panels, but thank you for being here. And everybody, thank you so much uh, for your uh, enthusiasm and the work that you all doing. So the panel today is called Enhancing Remote Teaching and Learning, Dominican Digital Open Source Materials and Visuals during the pandemic and beyond, right? Because it's not only because of the pandemic that we're doing the, the digital um, uh, projects, but beyond that. And uh, today we're going to have three different presentations. I am going to present about the projects, uh, the digital resources that we have available at our CUNY Dominican Studies Institute website. And Paul, Dr. Paul Osterlitz, our visiting professor, uh, a distinguished visiting professor, and our librarian, uh, Jensen Ortiz, are going to present about Dominican music in the United States. That's an active site that we um, launched this year. And we have Pedro de Jesus, who is a senior researcher that is going to present on a new project that is called, uh, called a visual representation of Washington Heights, Dominican culture and legacy. Okay, so I'm going to be, and, and then I, I need to mention that we have a couple of our own Dominican um, staff, CUNY Dominican Studies Institute staff. We have Jesse Perez, who is our archivist. I see that we have Matthew Santana, who has helped tremendously in putting together all these projects in the back end of the website. We have also Gracie Peralta that deals with our budget. Uh, we have also Ashley that helps us with communication and many other um, projects. And uh, we have also a past uh, staff member, Luan Ferreira. So thank you so much for joining. And I'm, I'm forgetting anyone, please, uh, later on. You can tell me, and we have Dolly Martinez, who is also used to be at Hostess Community College and is now back at the CUNY um, administration. So thank you so much. All right, so let's, let me begin. I'm going to share my screen and I am going to, to um, uh, talk to you about the, our website. So you give me a moment so I can share my screen. And do you see the nice uh, background, right? <laughs> okay, this is the website and the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute website is composed of many different projects. Today, I, I want to um, highlight some of them, but before el profesor se me vaya, I want to show something that I want him to see. In the About Us um, uh, page, uh, you can see that it says events and in the news, okay? And we have been working diligently to put all the events that we have um, created uh, since the beginning of the Institute. So if you go all the way down and I want to show you the 1990s because that's when Dr. Torres Ayan was with us. And uh, for example, um, let's say this event, Words from the Sea, Caribbean Diaspora Voices in US Literature. You remember that, Professor? So for example, if you click there, then it's going to give you the, um, the flyer or the program that uh, happened uh, to be for that 
specifically even. So we have all of them now. We have, since the first one that I found, North-South Counterpoint, Pedro Mir in uh, Whitman's native land, all the way to 2020, to the present. Wow, amazing. Yes, it has been a lot of work. And the ones that you see that don't have any links is that we're still looking diligently to find those wow. um, uh, you know, flyers and, and photos and, and the like. And then if we have, for example, photos in the Flickr account, we also put that in there. And people can see photos of the event. Wow. In the future, what we want to do is to um, put metadata into this. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, more information. For example, below the event, we want to put the venue, we want to put who participated, and the like detailed information. So that's coming um, hopefully in next year, in a couple of years, but uh, we're going to be doing that, right? So it's, that was a treat for you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> and then in another section we have um, in there about us is uh, in the news. And I'm going to open that one. I'm going to put a little bit like this so people can have a look. So in there, we also have in the news from the 90s as well. So let me go to the 90s again to show Professor. And let's say, um, let's see, let's talk about this one. As already struggling, Dominicans sink deeper into poverty study finds. And that was, was a study that uh, Dr. Ramon Hernandez, our current director, put together um, under the guidance of Dr. Torres Sayan. And what we did is that we put the link to the actual uh, article talking about the uh, whatever the publication, it may be an event and the like, all right? So in there you have a lot of information that you can also use when you want to like study uh, or the, the development of the Dominican field in the United States. Um, since the 90s, when we began at the Institute, all the way up to the present, right? <laughs> Sarah, I don't know if you remember that Giuliani, uh, that Giuliani denied uh, the truth of that report. Uh, he stood oh. up, and, uh, yeah, he stood up and said, that's not true. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it, it, because you cannot be poor in Giuliani's New York. Exactly, exactly. Right. So it, the, all the information is in there. So uh, also scholars that want to um, like, because there's so many topics in there, like a little history of the development of the field, they can use these materials, right? Why we did this? Because I had this information, many of this information was in my computer. Wow. Uh, I, was, I was like gatekeeping it. And yes, I love to have that in my computer, but I am also a librarian. And I believe in sharing information. And uh, I'm like the memory of the Institute because I have been there for the longest um, right now, <laughs> since 1994. And I didn't want to be only the memory. I want everybody to be the memory of the Institute. So that's why uh, we, we did this project. And I have to thank Matthew Santana, Jensen Ortiz, Javier Pichardo, and Waldemar um, that were with me in this project, okay? Have worked very diligently. All right, so this is part of the About Us, and then you can find more information about our staff, about the executive board and advisory board, the founders, and, and in there you are going to find amazing scholars that today are in different fields. And then you move to different areas, but I want to go to the digital resources first. This is where we, we recently put this um, link in there, and it's going to, to go to the different projects that we have. Today, um, we're going to talk about Dominican historic neighborhoods. That's Edward de Jesus' presentation. And then the other one that, um, A History of Dominican Music that Paul Austerlitz and Jensen Ortiz are going to talk about. But today I'm going to mention briefly some of these um, websites. For example, the first Blacks in the Americas, and we, if we go there, um, and then we, we teach classes only talking about these projects. So I'm just going to give you a little uh, taste so you can come back to it. 
And one of the parts that uh, I talked about at the beginning was the 1521 slave revolt, the first slave revolt in the Americas. And we happen to have the document. And that document was transcribed and translated by our, our own Anthony Stevens Acevedo, who is the person behind this amazing project and many other projects at the Institute. He happens to be a colonial historian and he's not retired, but we don't allow him to retire. <laughs> we, we work together in different projects all the time. So this, um, if you go to, for example, the um, part that is, is called resistance, and it has different topics on the top, but resistance, and you go there, and what we did with this uh, page is that we put together many of the documents that deal specifically with um, people not being okay with slavery, okay, resistance. And one of these documents is the document 19, which is the one that talks about the first revolt in the, Amer in the Española, in the Americas, okay? And you have the manuscript and no many of us know how to read this. So that's why Anthony decided to transcribe it. And uh, it's right here. And then we also wanted you to see a translation. And what we did is that we put together a an amazing um, monograph that Anthony authored. And you go there and, and it, it does that, so don't worry. I wanted to show you this because sometimes um, technology does those things. So you go back and then you insist, what is it, it's right here, yes. And then you go back and you do it again. And he gives you the publication. <laughs> so never say no to technology, try, try. And this is a, uh, the, monograph that we put together, um, Anthony is the author, and he talks about the rebellion, okay? And in there, you're going to see a translation of the, um, the laws, okay? So let's go back to First Blacks, yes. And in there, you're going to see many different topics and resources. We have 70 um, packages of resources from the 16th century, and only one from the 17th century that is the one dealing with uh, Juan Rodriguez, okay? So let's go back because I don't have much time. Then go go to the website, please. It's in bilingual, it's in English and Spanish. And uh, you're going to find a lot of great information about the colonial history of the Santo Domingo or what is today the Dominican Republic and, and Haiti. All right, let's, let's go to now to the 16th Central Española, which happens to be, um, we put together before First Blacks, the, an exhibit with 24 panels. And this is what we did. It is an Omeka site. And this is also part of JSTOR forum, right? So people who look into JSTOR can have access to this information. And what we did is that we put together the 24 manuscripts and, and they have information about, for example, the first known women to be a healer in Santo Domingo. Or la, it's called La Negra del Hospital. Licea Costa Cornel, Doctora Licea Costa Cornel, uh, was the one behind this exhibit together with Anthony Stevens and many of us. Okay. So go back to the page, digital resources. The other one is the Spanish Paleography tool. And in this tool, you learn how to read these manuscripts, right? It gives, it gives you an option for you to go letter by letter, as you see here, and then it tells you what it says. All right, we are in the process of putting together classes uh, on paleography, paleography uh, together with Archivo General de la Nación in the Dominican Republic, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so the other website that I want to mention quickly is Fighting for Democracy, who is, uh, which is um, a website dedicated to Dominican veterans in World War II. And we have um, panels here that talk about different amazing men and women. Uh, also, we have educational resources related to this. Uh, if you browse the collection, you can see here the different panels. One that I want to mention is the one that uh, really gets people attention and is the one about Stephen Hotis, who uh, was a Mocano uh, that came to the United States when he was very young and stayed here 
and was part of the Tuskegee Airmen. So we found a Dominican as the Tuskegee Airmen that they were the only uh, African-American pilots during World War II. And only a Dominican, but also we know that there were Haitians and other uh, Puerto Ricans and other Latinos, Afro-Latinos as well. So in the panel, we give a brief introduction to his life and the work he did during the uh, World War II. And here we have photos about his work as, uh, as resisting um, division and segregation within the US um, Army or the US um, Air Forces, uh, like he belonged to, right? So again, go back to the website and take a look uh, more calmly. And then the other one that we have is Dominican artists in the United States. This is a work in progress. We just have two. We have Josefina Baez, our well-known uh, Dominican educator and artist. We have some of her work here. Um, and also we have Doris Rodriguez that is a, a Dominican artist that lives in Florida and the United States, um, New York, I'm sorry. And her work, we had an event uh, recently with uh, her painting, her drawings. She, draw, she drew many of the doctors and also nurses and people who work at the um, hospitals, she drew them um, so they could see uh, their work and, and, how, and, and like they were very positive about that. We had a event with her. And then the last one that I want to showcase here is the Dominican Long Marks, which is a project that is also a work in progress and it tells you specifically places of Dominican and they have Dominican monuments, Dominican naming of streets and um, schools and the like. Okay, so you, you can see, you can choose. And for example, New York, you see has all, <laughs> almost all of them, but you can also see other points throughout um, the United States and throughout the world. And that you can also add information there for us. Okay, so uh, quickly, I want to go, that's in the digital resources, but I want to showcase to you a educational programs. I, since the beginning, that's, that's Jensen and myself teaching kids. Uh, since we began the Dominican Library, one of the missions was to showcase these materials to kids, primary and secondary sources, um, expose them not only to the sources, but also to the college environment. And uh, we have kids from fifth grade all the way to high school students. And of course, we have graduate, undergraduate, teaching fellows, we have people from the community. These materials uh, we put together for educators. Um, we don't want to listen to educators saying, oh, I don't teach my kids Dominican um, studies because I don't have information. We don't want that to happen. And that's why we put these uh, together. This one talks about the, the Dominican veterans in World War II. And it has three different um, lesson plans or curriculum that uh, uh, teachers can use, educators can use. And if you go there, it gives you the information when you go to the, it's right here. And you can plan your lesson based on these materials. When you talk to kids about um, veterans, you can talk to them about Dominicans. Uh, now you have the information available, free of charge, open source. Another one that, let me see if I can go back. Yes, right here is uh, History of Dominican Music in the United States. And Jensen is going to talk to you about that as well. And it has different educational profiles, okay? We are currently, we're working to put together uh, materials for these exhibits. And I'm going to show you the exhibits quickly here. We have also a page with the exhibits. And um, since we don't have many of these resources have been available digitally, um, but we're working on that. For example, we're doing this one. El Musico El Pintor is about um, Tito Canepa and uh, Rafael Pitton Guzman. And Jessie uh, Perez is right here. She's the archivist. And I know she's going to be very happy that I, I am telling her that we're working diligently to put this exhibit online with educational resources for teachers. We're also working to put together this one, uh, which is a um, an exhibit uh, of two Dominican artists 
And the other one that we are all working as well is this one, Dominican in New York, an exhibit from the Dominican Archives and Library Collection. So stay tuned for that. We are working uh, to put that together, right? So let's see, I want to go back quickly to the library side and then also tell you that you can visit the, um, right here, the film, video and audio collection. Unfortunately, now you cannot go to our space and look at this, but at least you have at least of these uh, resources. Uh, we are working from home and believe me, we are really working. <laughs> so you can email us anytime, do not worry ask any um, question that you might have and Jensen and myself are going to try to get the information for you. And I know that uh, also Jesse in the archives and Domidilio, who is our chief archivist are going also to be happy to answer your questions. So um, that was quickly, we can spend the whole day talking about all the resources that we have in the website, but now I want to, um, continue with this panel and I am going to give the podium, vamos a decirlo así, el podium virtual to our amazing uh, scholars, el Dr. Paul uh, Osterlis, that happens to be a distinguished visiting professor at CUNY Dominican Studies Institute and Jensen Ortiz, who is our librarian with a concentration in archives. So thank you so much and let's, let's give them the Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'll be presenting alongside Paul, Paul Ostevitz. Uh, Sarah, you can stop sharing your screen. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and for organizing this panel. So this project initially began in 2017 when we received a grant from NEH to begin the development of this digital platform. Uh, from the beginning, we discussed the importance of this being interactive because we didn't want users to just come on the site and start reading. Um, we wanted them to interact with video, audio, and images from our archives and library. Furthermore, the development of the project was done with a team of research. I was one of them at the Institute as we consulted the vast materials that were both in the archives and the library. Moreover, the research demonstrated that the key figures that we should focus on uh, should be highlighted in the project. A lot of them were unknown to us. Uh, thankful for the literature that existed before we began researching this project. Uh, and also there was uh, a willful neglect that was reflected on the contributions of Dominican music in the United States. Community gay engagement played an important role as we began conducting research and started to talk about the meaningful contributions that community members could make towards this project. So this is a flyer from the first uh, community collecting day event that we did at the Palm Music Heritage Center uh, in 2017. So now I'm gonna pass it along to Paul. Oh, okay, thank you, Jensen, so much. Um, uh, primero quiero decir que es un gran placer estar aquí hablando con la, de la música dominicana, pero sobre todo un honor hacerlo um, con mi, mis compañeros del Instituto de Estudios Dominicanos mi familia in Nueva York. It's, it's really amazing just to be here in that capacity, actually. And actually, my comments are going to sort of <clears throat> come from those two perspectives. As someone who's worked on Dominican music my whole life, <clears throat> um, and then now working on Dominican music at the DSI. So I kind of have this double perspective that I can share with you. And my um, interaction with the um, website on Dominican music in the United States originally was as a humanities advisor. And we had <clears throat> the, uh, 
these five humanities advisors that were um, um, asked to participate um, as part of the, the National Endowment for Humanities grant. And um, some of you might recognize some of these names, but they are um, major scholars in Dominican music who have um, very kind of conventional and I would say rigorous um, um, contributions to the subject. Um, the, and plus um, um, Raymond Torres Santos is a fantastic composer in his own right also. So we came, we brought that um, to the project um, and we had a, a role in it from its inception. Can you get to the next slide, please, Jensen? So um, as you would, you know, I'm not surprised. Everything that DSI does is rigorous scholarship. It's, it's meticulously documented with footnotes as all scholarship should be. There are a lot of original contributions to the field. A lot of things that I didn't know about um, Dominican music, I learned from the site, even though I had done extensive research on Dominican music. Um, it's basically historical. Um, and as does most musical scholarship today, it attends to questions, identity, race, gender, and migration, which all speak to its value. But um, can you go to the next slide, please? But I wanted to um, sort of talk about the ways that the site is different than the other scholarship that I've seen about music. And um, this actually dovetails nicely about with what Sara was talking about, because the site is notable for the, its diversity and democracy. You know, it, it's very, um, it's open sourced. Um, it has a, a, a democratic epistemology in the sense that it's open to everyone and takes input from everyone. Um, the methodology is also very um, diverse and um, so, you know, so I, I was really struck by that when I started working at the DSI. And unlike most ethnomusicology, and I've been in the field for a long time, it was written as, as a group project. So it's democratic in that way. It, it was really created as a, through group research and group writing. Um, all ethnomusicology is interdisciplinary, but this was even more so. We have library scientists, um, this chief investigator, Ramon Hernandez, is a sociologist. So it was even more interdisciplinary than other scholarships that I've seen. And unlike my previous work, it's geared at all levels. And it, it's really remarkable in that um, the way it's written, um, junior high students will have no trouble understanding it, but it's also very relevant to um, college students um, graduate students and professionals in the field, musicians in, uh, in the field have written us saying that they've been learning so much from it. So it's really, when I say all levels, I mean all levels. Um, it's notable for its grounding in archival resources, which is also something different than what I've encountered in my previous work. Um, the DSI, of course, has an archive. So when you look at the site, you'll be able to see all the rich um, visual um, um, material that's there. Most of it is, which is from the DSI archive. And also it has um, um, audio visual materials, multimedia formats. And then um, um, Jensen mentioned this, this kind of quickly, but I want to underline that when the research started, members of the DSI team went into the community and asked people to, um, participate and give material and be part of it. So all of this really makes it more diverse and more democratic in its epistemology, methodology, content, and dissemination than the other scholarship I've seen um, as an ethnomusicologist. Of course, it's open source and it has interactive features that Jensen will talk about later that um, it's a living document where members of the community can contribute to it as time unfolds. So can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and these were the three larger humanities themes that we were aiming for as the humanities advisors. Um, 
And I, I was really amazed. I mean, I knew it would be good, but I learned so much about, for example, early Dominican music um, in the 1915, you know, there was a Dominican classical violinist, Gabriel de Lorde, that was in New York. Also, um, uh, someone, hopefully if we have time, we'll see a video of the Malagón sisters who were on the Ed Sullivan show. It also treats Afro-Dominican music, um, even though, and things like people like Johnny Pacheco, who we most of us have heard of, there isn't that much material on Pacheco. And um, the site speaks about him, offers new data that were not available elsewhere. Um, but more importantly, um, it's always focusing on Dominican music as an integral part of the United States. I mentioned the Ed Sullivan Show, which was an icon of North American popular culture in the mid 20th century. So it really looks at that. But also, this is something that I noticed when I was reviewing the site, that because um, the United States and specifically New York has been a focal point of the global dissemination of popular music generally, New York played a central low role in the internationalization of Dominican music. So I was born in Finland. So they're dancing bachata in Finland, but New York played a role in bringing bachata from VR to Finland. And, and also very importantly, it treats um, the music within the context of the United States, the Dominican community specifically, as I mentioned um, a second ago. So yeah, you can move on, I guess, uh, Jensen. Yeah, so um, we launched uh, the platform in March in the midst of the pandemic as an attempt to uh, bring us together through music and try to lift each other's spirits. And we understood that um, folks were really dealing with a lot um, and we wanted to unveil the project in a series of five segments. So we promoted uh, initially Eduardo Brito and also Gabriel de Obre, who, who Paul just mentioned as a uh, as one of the pioneers early on in the 20th century of Dominican music. So let's go check out the site now. So this is the homepage for the for the website. As you can see, we have seven tabs here. Uh, the about page here addresses each individual section of the site, their narratives, are broken up into uh, specific uh, historical periods uh, covering 1910 to 2010. And uh, when you scroll down here, you can see the different titles for the decades that we're covering. The map here addresses uh, some of the historical and contemporary locations relevant to Dominican music in the United States. The resources has a bibliography of secondary sources related to Dominican music that you could browse to. And also the image archive and the audios from our resources that we have available in the archives in the library. And then lastly, I'm going to mention here the story section, which is where the public really could contribute to the site meaningfully with anecdotes and other documents and experiences that you have with Dominican music in the US. Paul, I'm going to let you talk about the general guides here. Okay. So also, by the way, since I think we're doing pretty well for time, I just wanted to notice, to note, to show, I can't, I guess I'm going to need to share my screen. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Because yeah, go ahead. I can't navigate. Yeah. By the way, Sarah showed her desktop. This is mine. So, um, um, but you know, we, we have a little bit of time. So I just want to show you all this beautiful um, images, most of, most of which are from the, our, the DSI archive. You know, these are old, so they're kind of um, black and white, but that's what's so cool about them because this is the 1910s and 20s, you know, and then, um, but it's just a visual feast, you know, just to jump to where you have like all this stuff to look at and also musical clips throughout. 
So you're listening along, you're reading along, you can look at these beautiful artwork, the album covers, and then um, there, there are clips that you can, where you can hear excerpts of the music. Um, and um, the, um, so I wanted to call your attention to the genre guide in contrast to the narratives. Like, so the narratives are um, historical and, you know, that's the main focus of the site, a history of Dominican music in the United States. But you, because it, I love the way it's kind of interactive so you can kind of interact with the stuff in, your, in different ways. You can add your own story about Dominican music. You can proceed geographically or you can go um, in terms of genres. Um, so you can kind of get into the topic um, through different angles. And um, of course we cover bachata and um, merengue, but um, I was really interested in contributing to the section on Afro-Dominican music. Um, but also the con contribution of Dominicans to um, Western classical music in the United States is really remarkable. So you had, I mentioned uh, um, Gabriel del Orbe who came in 1915, who was playing classical violin, um, but also we had Eduardo Brito in the 1930s who was sang tr uh, Caribbean popular songs, but he also um, sang operatic arias, um, even though he had not had opportunities to study classical music formally. He was singing this very, very um, rigorous repertoire that, whose origin was in Europe as an Afro-Dominican man in New York City and also traveling widely in Latin America and Europe and very um, widely in Europe, I think including Russia. So, and that was in the 1930s and 40s. And then you had Carlos Piantini who um, was a member of the New York Philharmonic and played in that organization when Leonard Bernstein was the conductor. And he also recorded an amazing piece, um, Piantini su violin, which was a charanga tune, a dance tune, um, which is really cool. So he was kind of moonlighting as a popular musician and um, we can, you know, you can listen to that. And he performed with Yehudi Menuhin, who's one of the best uh, violinists in the world, playing a wonderful piece, one of my favorites, the Bach double concerto. Um, and then also the ADCA, the Association of Dominican uh, Classical Artists, which um, has been around for many decades, but, and, and is still vibrant and under the leadership of Adang Vasquez has really become a very democratic organization in um, New York that's leading the way in bringing um, European based classical music to working class communities of color. And um, this is a preoccupation that uh, some of the bigger orchestras and schools of music have finally, at least are giving lip service to, at least acknowledge the importance of, but they haven't done as much in this realm as has Adan Vasquez with um, the series of concerts and educational outreach that he's done, um, bringing, um, classical music that comes from Europe, um, but became part of Latin American and African diaspora culture in the Americas and really showing how this is also part of Dominican music. Um, and also just briefly, cause I think I have a little bit of time. The, the, um, the Afro-Dominican section, which is one that I worked on a lot, you know, also has a basis in classical music because when you look at the, those Dominican genres like palos or congos or sarandunga, they um, developed from forms of classical music in Africa. Classical music is music that's played for kings and princes, you know, and those uh, royal court traditions of African music did come to the Caribbean. And they, the first place on the island of La Española where they came was um, the part that we, Call the Dominican Republic today. So, um, so these the Afro-Dominican part and the classical part aren't not as different as you might think. Um, 
And um, then lastly, I just want to show you here so you can see us again, just to read it, you can go chronologically, you can go geographically, you can go interactively, you can go bibliographically, and you can go genre-wise. But here, um, building on what Sana was saying, you can um, go pedagogically. And I like the way that this is not organized um, chronologically here. And I think that's on purpose, at least I like it, because time isn't always in a, a linear thing. You know, I'm a musician, so I think psychically and spiritual time can be cyclic too. So here we have Eduardo Brito, who I mentioned. And of course, we have to talk about Mili Casada, who has a very good relationship with the DSI and is a graduate of City College, where we're housed. And um, Monica Boyar, who was a singer um, in the mid 20th century New York City. Um, and then we have a more um, contemporary group represented, Proyecto Uno, who innovated in Merengue House. And so that's really important. And we definitely, we go all the way back more than 100 years, but we're very much grounded in today also. And I should say, we also have a very good relationship with members of Proyecto Uno and their manager, produ producer, um, is working with me on some projects right now. But I wanted to focus on the Malagón sisters because um, they were an amazing uh, group that, you know, I thought I knew something about Dominican music, but I hadn't heard of them. And they were a big presence in the United States in the mid 20th century. They sang um, tropical songs um, and had a lot of um, really major exposure in the United States media. Um, most notably, singing in 1957 on the Ed Sullivan Show. Now, some of you might not have heard of the Ed Sullivan Show, but as an older person who grew up in the United States, um, I can tell you the Ed Sullivan Show was the single most important forum for the dissemination of popular culture in the US in the mid 20th century. So when I was a little kid, I was, I was very, very little. Uh, the Beatles came to the US and when they played on the Ed Sullivan Show, that was huge. That's what made the Beatles known in the United States when they played on Ed Sullivan. And he had this kind of way of announcing the groups. It seems really old fashioned now. Even to me, it seemed a little bit in very traditional, not old fashioned, I guess, but just very, very traditional and very US, very gringo, you know, and they, so it's really interesting. We have this um, clip in the website of the Malagon sisters singing on the Ed Sullivan show and um, you, with um, Ed Sullivan um, introducing them. You know what, um, I'm gonna have to, um, Give me one minute. I'm going to stop sharing to make sure I'm sharing my audio. Otherwise, it's not going to sound right. I know about this because I teach uh, music classes, so I always have to share my audio. So I think oh, um, you'll enjoy this. Great dancing stars, isn't it? The timing, the way they walk and everything. Now from the Dominican Republic and the Chateau Madrid, three very handsome looking girls, the Malagon sisters, Raymond. <laughs> Cumba, 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 cumba
Um, so, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we can talk, if there's, if people are interested in those songs, the Babalu song, we can talk about that, but it's slightly a larger subject. But um, it's actually a Cuban song. It's a very interesting song. But so it, with these, um, in this section, so you can have a lot of fun listening to that and then also create your lesson plan or just teach yourself or um, by reading this and um, thinking about the discussion questions or assigning them to your students and having these activities. So um, just to sum up, um, and also nicely dovetailing on Sarah's presentation, what, as, as both a, now an insider and, but someone that's rather new to the DSI, I'm just amazed at, at the combination of rigor and democracy in, in what is offered here, specifically in this site, but in everything the DSI does. So it's, it's just as rigorous as anything I found when I was uh, working at Brown University. Um, but it's much more than that because it's connected to the community. It serves the community and it comes from the community. And the community meaning, I guess the Dominican community, but really the community of, of humankind because everyone can check this out. I know that my friends and relatives in, the, in Finland will be interested in this, you know, and they can check it out. So um, that's, that was what I wanted to say. Thank you, Jensen. I think Jensen was gonna close it out, so. Sure, yeah, let me get back to uh, the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, I don't have any more slides. I do wanna at least show uh, the public our emails in case they do wanna follow up with us. Whenever you're ready, Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, stop sharing, my fault. Thank you. So folks, here's our email addresses. If you want to continue the conversation on the website or you want to ask us any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for Dr. Osterlis and Jensen. Um, that was an amazing presentation. I enjoy that video every time I see, I dance with it. I, I really love it. 
Thank you for that. And then we're going now to go to the other presentation. And at the end, we're going to have a, I would like to call it a conversation, right? Among all of us. Um, Edward de Jesus, who was the person that I was going to present about the next project, is unable to make it today. He apologizes. But I, Edward, yo le, le consiento todo. <laughs> Edward de Jesus has been behind the project of the Dominican veterans. He was the one that um, rediscovered uh, our Tuskegee Airmen and many other um, incredible uh, research. So, um, and also he is behind the research that we're going to be discussing now. But I asked Matthew Santana, who was in uh, among us today, uh, who is the person that is the one that um, created the map and can talk to us about that. So if Matthew Santana is a student at Hostos Community College, by the way, he's studying to be a computer scientist and, um, and he works with us. So Matthew, if you can share your screen and, and share the map with everyone and then talk a little bit about the project. Thank you. Gladly. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> All right, is the map showing up fine? All right, good to hear. Uh, hi again, my name is Matthew Santana. I've been working with everyone else at the DSI on uh, this little Dominican Historic Neighborhoods project. Uh, apologies, I'm more on the tech side, so I'm not the best speaker out there. <laughs> um, overall, the objective is we are working on an application to, to do what we can to declare a portion of Washington Heights as a Dominican historic district. Uh, my part here is to help the public see what we're trying to do via this map of, as it says here, proposed Dominican historic district. You have the black borders outlining just what part of Washington Heights it is that we're trying to have declared in the application. Within the map, you can zoom in on this. You have various icons that uh, represent certain Dominican representations or landmarks. I click on one, let's say, for example, here you have the Church of the Incarnation at 175th and St. Nicholas. Go down. You have a Dominican, uh, sorry, you have a Dominican immigrant that made, that moved here uh, some time ago. My apologies, I forget the time period. On the uh, type, top right here, you have the legend that shows what each icon is supposed to kind of represent, so to speak. Let's say you have a street here, we'll click on this street. Carlos Alberto Mantinez Way, this is on St. Uh, Nick and 165th, yes. Uh, this website is accessible via both desktop and mobile, dominicanhistoricneighborhoods.com. We've done our best to kind of make sure it works properly for everybody. Uh, we have an about page here that kind of tells you uh, the overall introduction, why we're doing this, uh, what's the purpose of this, and we do intend to potentially go further in the future. You can contribute if you'd like to submit any information. There's a nice little Google form here. We'll, we'll get back to you if we have any further questions. Our contact informa information for the Institute, or if you'd like to send an email, uh, the share button, we got to get that fixed, apologies. <laughs> but overall, uh, th this is what we have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthew. And stay there, please, because I know people are going to have uh, questions about this. <clears throat> And Matthew was the one that created a map. And this is what we do at the Dominican Institute. We give opportunities to students, uh, undergrad, graduates. We treat everybody uh, like everybody can do things. Everybody can be experts. Everyone can contribute. And this is the way our projects have developed since the beginning. Like we pair seasoned scholars with upcoming scholars and students. And that's how we uh, have put together all these projects, digital and non-digital as well. So now let's open the floor uh, for questions, conversation. Please uh, show your faces if you want to. Um, if uh, Matthew can um, Stop sharing the screen for a moment. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you so much. And then people who want to show their faces can do that. And then we can have a conversation. Please ask your questions and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much for staying all this time. Hi, 
Professor Utaki, hola. <laughs> so nice to see you. <laughs> Kiara, hola. <laughs> These, these are scholars that have used the library. So I'm very grateful that they're here. Thank you. And the archives as well. All right, do you have any questions, um, any comments? What do you want us to expand a little bit more about? Please let us know. I, I'm kind of curious in terms of what your upcoming projects are gonna be. Okay, um, upcoming projects. Oh, there are many. <laughs> But uh, what we're trying to do right now is um, to fundraise, mainly, <laughs> right? We are putting together a document uh, to send to potential donors so they can help us in the different projects that we have in mind. For example, the research fellowships that we offer, uh, we need more funds for that. So, so people like you, you came uh, once to, to study um, and to research with us. And, and many other people. So we want to continue offering that. We also have in mind some residency programs and uh, Professor Austerlitz knows a little bit more about that, like in the arts, music, and all, um, like visual artists as well. And so we are really working on that. And also with uh, uh, researchers of not only like PhD candidates, but also master students and undergraduate students as well, independent scholars. Faculty, yeah. I don't know if Jensen or Paul or, or Matthew, anyone can add something to this. I would add that we're going to be expanding the Dominican Historic Neighborhoods Project, uh, focusing on other cities across the country with uh, historic Dominican presence: Washington D.C., Lawrence, Massachusetts, Dallas, Texas, uh, just to name a few. Yeah, and that project, the one that. Um, Matthew just showcase is um, we are under the guidance of Congressman Adrian Estallan, who wants uh, Washington Heights, like portions of Washington Heights, to be Kiskeja, uh, little Kiskeja, like little Italy, little China, like Chinatown. The same thing with the, the neighborhood in Washington Heights, because Dominicans are moving to different places, and we don't want to lose that historic um, version of it. This is a project that we are doing together with the congressman. And I was really happy to see that in his address to the conference yeah. today, he talked about that a lot. That's a big priority for him. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very interesting project, a lot of work. And some of the people, Waldemar is here, who's working on that. And I just wanted to um, say again, you know, thank you, Matthew Santana for jumping in doing that. And, Having, you know, it's, it really just underlines what I was trying to say, the kind of democratic and diverse way that we operate, you know, that um, working with people like Matthew has been so inspiring to me because he's really doing high level original scholarship, you know, at that level and learning in the process, you know. Um, also, there's a lot of things that are more under the radar. There are many scholars associated with the Institute who are do doing their own research on their own, um, including myself. And I've been working with um, John Bimbiras, who worked at the Institute many years on um, a wonderful Dominican musician, Rafael Guzman Petiton, who lived in New York City in the mid 20th century. And um, John did a lot of research on Petiton and then I joined and helped him and we are now completing a book about Petiton, which like the website calls upon a lot of archival materials, a lot of gorgeous visuals. But then John also um, rearranged Petiton's music. So the, um, the so Dr. Hernandez had the vision and the commitment to the arts to invest a lot of time and economic resources into re-recording the music by this giant of Dominican music who lived in New York City in the United uh, in the mid 20th century. So we're also going to be presenting um, his music in um, like new new versions, new interpretations of his music. And this is almost done. And I just wanted to also say that to me, I was really amazed when I started working on this um, at the high profile that Petiton had during his heyday 
and the amazingly high level of his musicianship and his contribution. But even uh, that didn't surprise me because there's so many great musicians. I was amazed by the fact that I'd never heard of him and no one had heard of him. No one, none of the existing literature talks about Rafael Petiton. And he was just kind of whited out of the historiography of Latin music in New York City. And uh, which is a very well studied and you know topic with lots of bibliography, and it just it has a lot of implications for the study of canon formation. So we usually talk about canon formation in terms of like the great books of Europe or something, but it, it, but even in the historiography of uh, Latin music in the United States, there's this kind of um, way the canon has been written as being Cuban music played by often by Puerto Ricans, you know, and that the Dominican contribution is, has not been um, highlighted until the 1970s or 80s when a lot of Domin more Dominicans came to the United States, but there were Dominicans in the US before that. And so Petiton's um, um, career and work really um, demonstrate that. And also, as I said, have larger implications for the study of canon formation and understanding um, la um, Latino music in the United States and Latino culture in the United States. Um, so that's another thing. And there's so many other scholars at the D DSI who are working on their own scholarship. Um, but I want to share that little plug maybe, but. Well, thank you so much. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, I'd like to ask the questions, but yeah. um, um, so my dissertation was devoted to um, Dominican student success, you know, basically understanding, you know, the factors that promote baccalaureate degree completion among Dominicans. And I'm curious if there, if there are any programs that you offer for people who want to continue to write about Dominicans, or are there new journals that you're aware of specifically devoted to or, you know, for Dominicans? Right. Um, yes, we we have information about no journals dedicated entirely to Dominican studies, but journals that are publishing Dominican related topics. So if you email us, join. Yes. I can give you a list of some of those and also uh, guide you through, uh, connect you with people that are working on, on the topic and, and the like. So please email us. Um, Jensen, if you can put the email in the chat, so Joanne can email us and we can send her the information. And congratulations, by the way. Thank you so much. We need these attentions like that more than ever. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. And before I forget, I want to mention Nelson Santana. Nelson Santana is here. Verdad, uh, Nelson, tú andas por ahí. <laughs> claro, sí, sí. <laughs> Nelson Santana worked with us for many years and was behind many of these projects. Ah, mira lo ahí tan bonito. Was behind many of these projects and especially the Dominican music one. And I remember he presented with Jensen. Um, he presented you know, on a timeline that like they put together. And I want to acknowledge that. I want people to know that you have been um, a very important backbone of what we do at the Dominican Institute. Y ahora un profesor tan lindo allá en Bronx Community College. <laughs> so yes, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, any questions, more comments, please? Michael Miller, Nelson cannot sing. <laughs> oh, Michael, you're here. Thank you so much for being here. Michael Miller is the uh, chief librarian at Bronx Community College. Thank you for the support. <laughs> it's a great session, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Professor Sellers is here too. I see her, yes. Professor Sellers is a um, also a scholar um, that has published Dominican related books, and specifically on music. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having this.
Any questions, comments? I also see Professor Nancy Khan. Are you in Canada, Professor Khan? Or you're in Stirkin? Yeah, hi from Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Sorry, I was late. <laughs> And please do share uh, these resources with um, faculty, other faculty, educators as well, teachers. We want kids to have this information available for them. Any specific questions about the projects? Not specifically about the project. This is Miller again. Um, I was just wondering um, directly at Matt, um, are you headed towards a baccalaureate degree program somewhere? What do you have yes, planned? Uh, it's worth mentioning, I, uh, apologies. I kind of pretend to forget to clarify this. Uh, I actually graduated from Hostos already last year. I'm currently at John Jay. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, Matthew is one of our, um, he began as a volunteer with us. And he was very shy. Era, era timido, ahora es temido. <laughs> I, I can agree there. I used to be very just quiet and now it, it's, I'm just happy to be a part of this big family we have at a DSI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think many of us began as work study students or as uh, volunteers. Jensen also began as a volunteer. Right. Jensen began as a work study student. Um, I like that. So yes, this is a, we nurture our own. Luana, tú estás muy calladita, di algo. Doctora Ferreira. Saludos, saludo mi gente del CUNY DSI. I am so privileged to share this space once again with all of you. For those of you that don't know, I was the former director of projects at the Dominican Studies Institute. And then I moved on to uh, a teaching position at Hunter College, where I teach bilingual education. Y para mí es un verdadero placer estar con mis hermamigos del CUNY DSI. Uh, as a linguist, I give myself allowance to create new words. So para mí, toda la gente del DSI Eh, son mis hermamigos, mi hermamiga, Sara Ponte. I think about you. I miss you tremendously. And Palante, I'm, I'm so proud of all of this work that mm -hmm. you all are producing. And I'm proud to still be affiliated with, with the Institute. Siempre, doctora Ferreira, siempre. <laughs> Gracias por el trabajo que haces. Sí. And Ashley Santos is here with us too. She works with us. Um, I didn't mention her before, right? I'm just curious, does, um, do any of the people here have any points of comparison or are similar approaches to research and dissemination of research um, being accomplished where you work or, um, or no? And if not, can you, Talk about that, um, because as, as I said, as someone who's rather new to the DSI, it's so different than the model that I've found in other universities that I've worked at, where it's very ivory tower. You know, you have these researchers writing these things and they're basically doing it because they care about it or to get tenure. Um, and, um, and then you have these people with PhD, getting their PhDs or populating these different places and teaching. But having, you know, we, we really, we have workshops for elementary school students. And as Sara said, everyone kind of works together, you know, like I can say, I can tell you that the work that Waldemar and Matthew have done is just, is high level, you know, they're my colleagues. And then we also have, you know, the, you know, the illustrious former director, Silvia Torres Sayan, you know, and Dr. Hernandez, you know, who is a sociologist who has supported the arts, you know, and really understands the value of the arts, even though she comes from a different discipline. So I'm just curious, is that kind of collaboration going on in the institutions where you work?
Oh, parece que no. <risa> parece que no. <risa> Sí, pero thank you for the question, Paul, and um, we don't have much time. Ya se me dice, Nelson, que, que se nos acaba el tiempo, ¿verdad? But we really wanted to thank everybody for um, staying here with us. There are so many different panels going on, and as you saw in the chat, eh, Nelson Ortiz invited you to, to be part of the other conversation at 5 p.m. Um, you need to go to the website and, and get that. Okay, so yes, uh, Cynthia Tobar, she's a friend of ours, absolutely. And she's promoting learning for our students. Absolutely, she does that type of work. Um, I really commend her work. Yes. So if I, I want to thank um, Dr. Osterlitz and, and Jensen for the great presentation about our Dominican Music website. And of course, mi queridísimo Matthew, Mateo, como yo le digo, <laughs> for stepping in. I just called him and said, hey, Edward cannot make it, please come. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and he did an amazing job. Um, so thank you so much for everybody uh, for staying with us. And uh, we are here for you. Email us um, and be in contact. Go to our webpage, leave, leave uh, any messages and any information. So thank you and keep up the great work. Y que viva Dominican Studies. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Gracias. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Gracias, Nelson Ortiz. Eh? Gracias. <laughs>